Chapter 12 Camera Work in the Jungle The completed cage with Gypsy behind the bars framed a spectacle sufficiently thrilling and panther-like. Gypsy raved, spat, struck virulently at taunting fingers, turned on his wailing siren for minutes at a time, and he gave his imitation of a dromedary almost continuously. These phenomena could be intensified in picturesqueness, the boys discovered, by rocking the cage a little, tapping it with a hammer, or raking the bars with a stick. Altogether, Gypsy was having a lively afternoon. There came a vigorous rapping on the alley door of the stable, and Vermin was admitted. Yay, Vermin, cried Sam Williams. Come and look at our good old panther. Another curiosity, however, claimed Vermin's attention. His eyes opened wide, and he pointed at Herman's legs. Wamau, Mammy heu hip up ho woob. Mammy tell me get at stove wood? Herman interpreted resentfully. How am I go get at stove wood when my britches down bottom at cistern? I like you answer me, please. You shed at do behind you. Vermin complied, and again, pointing to his brother's legs, requested to be enlightened. Sin I told you once they down bottom at cistern, Herman shouted, much exasperated. You want know how come so, you ass Sam Williams. He say this here cat tuck and thou'd him down there. Sam, who was busy rocking the cage, remained cheerfully absorbed in that occupation. Come look at our good old panther, Vermin, he called. I'll get this circus cage rocking right good and then... Wait a minute, said Penrod. I got something I got to think about. Quit rocking it. I guess I got a right to think about something without having to go deaf, haven't I? Having obtained the quiet so plaintively requested, he knit his brow and gazed intently upon Vermin, then upon Herman, then upon Gypsy. Evidently, his idea was fermenting. He broke the silence with a shout. I know, Sam. I know what we'll do now. I just thought of it. And it's going to be something I bet there aren't any other boys in this town could do, because where would they get any good old panther like we got, and Herman and Vermin? And they'd have to have a dog, too. And we got our good old Dukey, I guess. I bet we have the greatest old time this afternoon we ever had in our lives. His enthusiasm roused the warm interest of Sam, and Vermin, though Herman, remaining cold and suspicious, asked for details. And I like to hear if it's something, he concluded. What's go get me my britches back out in its cistern? Well, it ain't exactly that, said Penrod. It's different from that. What I'm thinking about, well, for us to have it the way it ought to be, so's you and Vermin would look like natives. Well, Vermin ought to take off his britches, too. Mo, said Vermin, shaking his head violently. Mo. Well, wait a minute, can't you? Sam Williams said. Give Penrod a chance to say what he wants to. First, can't you? Go on, Penrod. Well, you know, Sam, said Penrod, turning to this sympathetic auditor. You remember that moving picture show we went to, Forty Graffing Wild Animals in the Jungle? Well, Herman wouldn't have to do a thing more to look like those natives we saw that the man called the Beaters. They were dressed just about like the way he is now, and if Vermin— M.O., said Vermin. Oh, wait a minute, Vermin, Sam entreated. Go on, Penrod. Well, we can make a mighty good jungle up in the loft, Penrod continued eagerly. We can take that old dead tree that's out in the alley and some branches, and I bet we could have the best jungle you ever saw, and then we'd fix up a kind of place in there for our panther— only, of course, we'd have to keep him in the cage so's he wouldn't run away. But we'd pretend he was loose. And then you remember how they did with that calf. Well, we'd have Duke for the tied-up calf for the panther to come out and jump on so they could forty-graph him. Herman can be the chief beater, and we'll let Vermin be the other beaters, and I'll... <laughs> "'Yay!' shouted Sam Williams. "'I'll be the forty-graph man!' No, said Penrod, you be the one with the gun that guards the forty-graph man, because I'm the forty-graph man already. You can fix up a mighty good gun with this carpenter shop, Sam. 
will make spears for our good old beaters too. And I'm going to make me a camera out of that little starch box and a baking powder can that's going to be a mighty good old camera. We can do lots more things. Yay, Sam cried. Let's get started. He paused. Wait a minute, Penrod. Vermin says he won't. Well, he's got to, said Penrod. I'm Momp, Vermin insisted, almost distinctly. They began to argue with him, but for a time, Vermin remained firm. They upheld the value of dramatic consistency, declaring that a beater dressed as completely as he was wouldn't look like anything at all. He would spoil the whole business, they said, and they praised Herman for the faithful accuracy of his costume. They also insisted that the garment in question was much too large for Vermin anyway. Having been so recently worn by Herman and turned over to Vermin with insufficient alteration, and they expressed surprise that anybody with any sense should make such a point of clinging to a misfit. Herman sided against his brother in this controversy, perhaps because a certain loneliness, of which he was sensuous, might be assuaged by the company of another trouserless person, or it may be that his motive was more sombre. Possibly he remembered that Vermin's trousers were his own former property and might fit him in case the promise for five o'clock turned out badly. At all events, Vermin finally yielded under great pressure and consented to appear in the proper costume of the multitude of beaters it now became his duty to personify. Shouting, the boys dispersed to begin the preparation of their jungle scene. Sam and Penrod went for branches and the dead tree, while Herman and Vermin carried the panther in his cage to the loft, where the first thing that Vermin did was to hang his trousers on a nail in a conspicuous and accessible spot near the doorway. And with the arrival of Penrod and Sam, panting and dragging no inconsiderable thicket after them, the coloured brethren began to take a livelier interest in things. Indeed, when Penrod, a little later, placed in their hands two spears pointed with tin, their good spirits were entirely restored, and they even began to take a pride in being properly uncostumed beaters. Sam's gun and Penrod's camera were entirely satisfactory, especially the latter. The camera was so attractive, in fact, that the hunter and the chief beater and all the other beaters immediately resigned and insisted upon being photographers. Each had to be given a turn before the jungle project could be resumed. Now, for goodness's sakes, said Penrod, taking the camera from Vermin, I hope you're done, so as we can get started doing something like we ought to. We got to have Duke for a tied-up calf. We'll have to bring him and tie him out here in front of the jungle, and then the panther will come out and jump on him. Wait, and I'll go bring him. Departing upon this errand, Penrod found Duke enjoying the declining rays of the sun in the front yard. Hugh, Duke, called his master in an indulgent tone. Come on, good old Dukey, come along. Duke rose conscientiously and followed him. I got him, men, Penrod called from the stairway. I got our good old calf all ready to be tied up. Here he is and he appeared in the doorway with the unsuspecting little dog beside him. Gypsy, who had been silent for some moments, instantly raised his banshee battle cry, and Duke yelped in horror. Penrod made a wild effort to hold him, but Duke was not to be detained. Unnatural strength and activity came to him in his delirium, and for the second or two that the struggle lasted, his movements were too rapid for the eyes of the spectators to follow. Merely a whirl and blur in the air could be seen. Then followed a sound of violent scrambling, and Penrod sprawled alone at the top of the stairs. "'Well, why don't you come and help me?' he demanded indignantly. "'I couldn't get him back now if I was to try a million years.' What are we going to do about it? Sam asked. Penrod rose and dusted his knees. We gotta get along without any tied up calf, that's certain. But I gotta take those forty graphs some way or other. Me and Vermin already begin at beaten, Herman suggested. You told us we the beaters. Well, wait a minute, said Penrod, whose feeling for realism in drama was always alert. 
I want to get a mighty good picture of that old panther this time. As he spoke, he threw open the wide door intended for the delivery of hay into the loft from the alley below. Now bring the cage over here by this door so as I can get a better light. It's getting kind of dark over where the jungle is. We'll pretend there isn't any cage there, and soon as I get him forty graft, I'll holler, Shoot, men! Then you must shoot. Sam and Herman, you and Vermin, must hammer on the cage with your spears and holler, Who, who! and pretend your spear in him. Well, we all ready, said Herman. Who, who? Wait a minute, Penrod interposed, frowningly surveying the cage. I got to squat too much to get my camera fixed right. He assumed various solemn poses to be interpreted as those of a photographer studying his subject. No, he said finally, it won't take good that way. My goodness, Herman exclaimed, when we go in begin it beaten. Here. Apparently Penrod had solved a weighty problem. Bring that busted old kitchen chair and set the panther up on it. There, that's the ticket. This way it'll make a mighty good picture. He turned to Sam importantly. Well, Jim, is the chief and all his beaters here? Yes, Bill, all here, Sam responded with an air of loyalty. Well, then, I guess we're ready, said Penrod in his deepest voice. Beat men. Herman and Vermin were anxious to beat. They set up the loudest uproar of which they were capable. Who, 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 they bellowed, flailing the branches with their spears and stamping heavily upon the floor. Sam, carried away by the Ellen of the performance, was unable to resist joining them. Who, 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 he shouted. Who, who, who? And as the dust rose from the floor to their stamping, the three of them produced such a din and hoo-hooing as could be made by nothing on earth except boys. Back, men, Penrod called, raising his voice to the utmost. Back for your lives, the PAA Anther. Now I'm taking his picture. Click, click. Shoot, men, shoot. Bing, bing shouted Sam, levelling his gun at the cage, while Herman and Vermin hammered upon it, and Gypsy cursed boys, the world, and the day he was born. Bing! 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 You missed him, screamed Penrod. Give me that gun! And snatching it from Sam's unwilling hand, he levelled it at the cage. Bing! he roared. Simultaneously, there was the sound of another report, but this was an actual one, and may best be symbolized by the statement that it was a whack. The recipient was Herman, and outrageously surprised and pained. He turned to find himself face to face with a heavily built colored woman who had recently ascended the stairs and approached the preoccupied hunters from the rear. In her hand was a lath, and even as Herman turned, it was again wielded, this time upon Vermin. Mommy! Yes, you bet you holler, Mammy, she panted. My gooness if your pappy don't lamb you tonight. Ain't you got no more sense to let white boys suede you play you African heathums? Why, you britches? Your new vermins, quavered Herman. Why, yown? Choking, Herman answered bravely, At old cat tuck and thowdom down cistern. Exasperated almost beyond endurance, she lifted the lath again. But unfortunately, in order to obtain a better field of action, she moved backward a little, coming in contact with the bars of the cage, a circumstance that she overlooked. More unfortunately still, the longing of the captive to express his feelings was such that he would have welcomed the opportunity to attack an elephant. He had been striking and scratching at inanimate things and at boys out of reach for the past hour, but here at last was his opportunity. He made the most of it. I learn you tell me, cat thawed. Oh! The coloured woman leaped into the air like an athlete, and turning with a swiftness astounding in one of her weight, beheld the semaphoric arm of Gypsy again extended between the bars and hopefully reaching for her. Beside herself, 
she lifted her right foot briskly from the ground and allowed the sole of her shoe to come in contact with Gypsy's cage. The cage moved from the tottering chair beneath it. It passed through the yawning hay door and fell resoundingly to the alley below, where, as Penrod and Sam, with cries of dismay, rushed to the door and looked down, it burst asunder and disgorged a large bruised and chastened cat. Gypsy paused and bent one strange look upon the broken box. Then he shook his head and departed up the alley, the two boys watching him till he was out of sight. Before they turned, a harrowing procession issued from the carriage house doors beneath them. Herman came first, hurriedly completing a temporary security in Vermin's trousers. Vermin followed, after a little reluctance that departed coincidentally with some inspiriting words from the rear. He crossed the alley hastily, and his mammy stalked behind, using constant eloquence and a frequent laugh. They went into the small house across the way and closed the door. Then Sam turned to Penrod. Penrod, he said thoughtfully, was it on account of forty graphing in the jungle you wanted to keep that cat? No, that was a mighty fine-blooded cat. We'd have made some money. Sam jeered. <coughs> you mean when we'd sell tickets to look at it in its cage? Penrod shook his head, and if Gypsy could have overheard and understood his reply, that atrabilious spirit, almost broken by the events of the day, might have considered this last blow the most overwhelming of all. No, said Penrod, when she had kittens. Chapter 13 a model letter to a friend. On Monday morning, Penrod's faith in the coming of another Saturday was flaccid and lusterless. Those Japanese lovers who were promised a reunion after ten thousand years in separate hells were brighter with hope than he was. On Monday, Penrod was virtually an agnostic. Nowhere upon his shining morning face could have been read any eager anticipation of useful knowledge. Of course, he had been told that school was for his own good. In fact, he had been told and told and told, but the words conveying this information, meaningless at first, assumed, with each repetition, more and more the character of dull and unsolicited insult. He was wholly unable to imagine circumstances, present or future, under which any of the instruction and training he was now receiving could be of the slightest possible use or benefit to himself, and when he was informed that such circumstances would frequently arise in his later life, he but felt the slur upon his coming manhood and its power to prevent any such unpleasantness. If it were possible to place a romantic young Broadway actor and athlete under hushing supervision for six hours a day, compelling him to bend his unremittent attention upon the city directory of Sheboygan, Wisconsin, he could scarce be expected to respond genially to frequent statements that the compulsion was all for his own good. On the contrary, it might be reasonable to conceive his response as taking the form of action which is precisely the form that Penrod's smouldering impulse yearned to take. To Penrod's school was merely a state of confinement, envenomed by mathematics. For interminable periods he was forced to listen to information concerning matters about which he had no curiosity whatever, and he had to read over and over the dullest passages in books that bored him into stupors, while always there overhung the preposterous task of improvising plausible evasions to conceal the fact that he did not know what he had no wish to know. Likewise, he must always be prepared to avoid incriminating replies to questions that he felt nobody had a real and natural right to ask him. And when his gorge rose and his inwards revolted, the hours became a series of ignoble misadventures and petty disgraces strikingly lacking in privacy. It was usually upon Wednesday that his sufferings culminated. The nervous strength accumulated during the holiday hours at the end of the week would carry him through Monday and Tuesday. But by Wednesday, it seemed ultimately proven that the next Saturday actually never was coming, this time, and the strained spirit gave way. 
Wednesday was the day averaging highest in Penrod's list of absences. But the time came when he felt that the advantages attendant upon his Wednesday sick headache did not compensate for its inconveniences. For one thing, this illness had become so symmetrically recurrent that even the cook felt that he was pushing it too far, and the liveliness of her expression when he was able to leave his couch and take the air in the backyard at about ten o'clock became more disagreeable to him with each convalescence. There visibly increased, too, about the whole household, an atmosphere of uncongeniality and suspicion so pronounced that every successive illness was necessarily more severe, and at last the patient felt obliged to remain bedded until almost eleven, from time to time giving forth pathetic little sounds, eloquent of anguish, triumphing over stoic endurance, yet lacking a certain conviction of utterance. Finally, his father enacted, and his mother applied, a new and distinctly special bit of legislation, explaining it with simple candor to the prospective beneficiary. Whenever you really are sick, they said, you can go out and play as soon as you're well, that is, if it happens on Saturday. But when you're sick on a school day, you'll stay in bed till the next morning. This is going to do you good, Penrod. Physically, their opinion appeared to be affirmed, for Wednesday after Wednesday passed without any recurrence of the attack, but the spiritual strain may have been damaging. And it should be added that if Penrod's higher nature did suffer from the strain, he was not unique. For confirming the effect of Wednesday upon boys in general, it is probable that, if full statistics concerning cats were available, they would show that cats dread Wednesdays, and that their fear is shared by other animals, and would be shared to an extent by windows, if windows possessed nervous systems. Nor must this probable apprehension on the part of cats and the like be thought mere superstition. Cats have superstitions, it is true, but certain actions inspired by the sight of a boy with a missile in his hand a better evidence of the workings of logic upon a practical nature than of faith in the supernatural. Moreover, the attention of family physicians and specialists should be drawn to these significant, though obscure, phenomena. For the suffering of cats is a barometer of the nerve pressure of boys, and it may be accepted as sufficiently established that Wednesday, after school hours, is the worst time for cats. After the promulgation of that parental edict, you'll stay in bed till the next morning, four weeks went by unflawed by a single absence from the field of duty. But when the fifth Wednesday came, Penrod held sore debate within himself before he finally rose. In fact, after rising, and while actually engaged with his toilet, he tentatively emitted the series of little moans that was his wonted preliminary to a quiet holiday at home. And the sound was heard, as intended, by Mr. Schofield, who was passing Penrod's door on his way to breakfast. All right, the father said, making use of peculiar and unnecessary emphasis. Stay in bed till tomorrow morning. Castor oil this time too. Penrod had not hoped much for his experiment. Nevertheless, his rebellious blood was sensibly inflamed by the failure, and he accompanied his dressing with a low murmuring, apparently a bitter dialogue between himself and some unknown but powerful patron. Thus he muttered, Well, they better not. Well, what can I do about it? Well, I'd show em. Well, I will show em. Well, you ought to show em. That's the way I do. I just shake em around and say, Here. I guess you don't know who you're talking to like that. You better look out. Well, that's the way I'm going to do. Well, go on and do it then. Well, I am going. The door of the next room was slightly ajar. Now it swung wide and Margaret appeared. Penrod. What on earth are you talking about? Nothing. None of your... Well, hurry to breakfast, then. It's getting late. Lightly she went, humming a tune, leaving the door of her room open, and the eyes of Penrod, as he donned his jacket, chanced to fall upon her desk, where she had thoughtlessly left a letter, 
a private missive just begun, and intended solely for the eyes of Mr. Robert Williams, a senior at a far university. In such a fashion is coincidence the architect of misfortune. Penrod's class in English composition had been instructed the previous day to concoct at home and bring to class on Wednesday morning a model letter to a friend on some subject of general interest. Penalty for omission to perform this simple task was definite. Whosoever brought no letter would inevitably be kept in after school that afternoon until the letter was written, and it was precisely a premonition of this misfortune that had prompted Penrod to attempt his experimental moaning upon his father, for, alas, he had equipped himself with no model letter nor any letter whatever. In stress of this kind, a boy's creed is that anything is worth a try, but his eye for details is poor. He sees the future too sweepingly and too much as he would have it seldom providing against inconsistencies of evidence that may damage him. For instance, there is a well-known case of two brothers who exhibited to their parents with pathetic confidence several imported dried herring on a string as a proof that the afternoon had been spent not at a forbidden circus, but with hook and line upon the banks of a neighbouring brook. So with Penrod. He had vital need of a letter, and there before his eyes, upon Margaret's desk, was apparently the precise thing he needed. From below rose the voice of his mother, urging him to the breakfast table, warning him that he stood in danger of tardiness at school. He was pressed for time, and acted upon an inspiration that failed to prompt him even to read the letter. Hurriedly, he wrote Dear Framed at the top of the page Margaret had partially filled. Then he signed himself, Yours respectfully, Penrod Schofield, at the bottom, and enclosed the missive within a battered volume entitled Principles of English Composition. With that and other books compacted by a strap, he descended to a breakfast somewhat oppressive but undarkened by any misgivings concerning a letter to a friend on some subject of general interest. He felt that a difficulty had been encountered and satisfactorily disposed of. The matter could now be dismissed from his mind. He had plenty of other difficulties to take its place. No, he had no misgivings, nor was he assailed by anything unpleasant in that line, even when the hour struck for the class in English composition. If he had been two or three years older, experience might have warned him to take at least the precaution of copying his offering so that it would appear in his own handwriting when he handed it in. But Penrod had not even glanced at it. I think, Miss Spence said, I will ask several of you to read your letters aloud before you hand them in. Clara Raypole, you may read yours. Penrod was bored but otherwise comfortable. He had no apprehension that he might be included in the several, especially as Miss Spence's beginning with Clara Raypole, a star performer, indicated that her selection of readers would be made from the conscientious and proficient division at the head of the class. He listened stoically to the beginning of the first letter, though he was conscious of a dull resentment, inspired mainly by the perfect complacency of Miss Raypole's voice. Dear Cousin Sadie, she began smoothly, I thought I would write you today on some subject of general interest, and so I thought I would tell you about the subject of our courthouse. It is a very fine building situated in the centre of the city, and a visit to the building after school hours well repays for the visit. Upon entrance we find upon our left the office of the county clerk, and upon our right a number of windows affording a view of the street, and so we proceed, finding on both sides much of general interest. The building was begun in 1886 A.D., and it was through in 1887 A.D. It is four stories high and made of stone, pressed brick, wood, and tiles, with a tower or cupola, 127 feet, 7 inches from the ground. Among other subjects of general interest told by the janitor, we learn that the architect of the building was a man named Flanner, 
and the foundations extend fifteen feet five inches under the ground. Penrod was unable to fix his attention upon these statistics. He began moodily to twist a button of his jacket and to concentrate a newborn and obscure but lasting hatred upon the courthouse. Miss Raypole's glib voice continued to press upon his ears, but by keeping his eyes fixed upon the twisting button, he had accomplished a kind of self-hypnosis or mental anesthesia, and was but dimly aware of what went on about him. The courthouse was finally exhausted by its visitor, who resumed her seat and submitted with beamish grace to praise. Then Miss Spence said, in a favourable manner, Georgie Bassett, you may read your letter next. The neat Georgie rose, nothing loath, and began, Dear teacher, there was a slight titter, which Miss Spence suppressed. Georgie was not at all discomfited. My mother says, he continued, reading his manuscript, we should treat our teacher as a friend, and so I will write you a letter. This penetrated Penrod's trance and he lifted his eyes to fix them upon the back of Georgie Bassett's head in a long and inscrutable stare. It was inscrutable, and yet if Georgie had been sensitive to thought waves, it is probable that he would have uttered a loud shriek, but he remained placidly unaware, continuing, I thought I would write you about a subject of general interest, and so I will write you about the flowers. There are many kinds of flowers, spring flowers and summer flowers and autumn flowers, but no winter flowers. Wild flowers grow in the woods, and it is nice to hunt them in springtime, and we must remember to give some to the poor and hospitals also. Flowers can be made to grow in flower beds and placed in vases in houses. There are many names for flowers, but I call them nature's ornaments. Penrod's gaze had relaxed, drooped to his button again, and his lethargy was renewed. The outer world grew vaguer. Voices seemed to drone at a distance. Sluggish time passed heavily, but some of it did pass. Penrod! Miss Spencer's searching eye had taken note of the bent head and the twisting button. She found it necessary to speak again. Penrod Schofield! He came languidly to life. Ma'am? You may read your letter. Yes, am and he began to pore clumsily among his books, whereupon Miss Spencer's glance fired with suspicion. "'Have you prepared one?' she demanded. "'Yes, am said Penrod dreamily. "'But you're going to find you forgot to bring it, aren't you?' "'I got it,' said Penrod, discovering the paper in his Principles of English Composition. "'Well, we'll listen to what you've found time to prepare,' she said, adding coldly, for once. The frankest pessimism concerning Penrod permeated the whole room. Even the eyes of those whose letters had not met with favour turned upon him with obvious assurance that here was every prospect of a performance that would, by comparison, lend a measure of credit to the worst preceding it. But Penrod was unaffected by the general gaze. He rose, still blinking from his lethargy, and in no true sense, wholly alive. He had one idea, to read as rapidly as possible, so as to be done with the task, and he began in a high-pitched monotone, reading with a blind mind, and no sense of the significance of the words. Dear friend, he declaimed, you call me beautiful, but I am not really beautiful, and there are times when I doubt if I am even pretty, though perhaps my hair is beautiful, and if it is true that my eyes are like blue stars in heaven? Simultaneously he lost his breath, and there burst upon him a perception of the results to which he was being committed by this calamitous reading, and also simultaneous the outbreak of the class into cachinations of delight, severely repressed by the perplexed but indignant Miss Spence. Go on, she commanded grimly, when she had restored order. Ma'am? he gulped, looking wretchedly upon the rosy faces all about him. Go on with the description of yourself, she said. We'd like to hear some more about your eyes being like blue stars in heaven. Here many of Penrod's little comrades were forced to clasp their faces tightly in both hands, 
and his dismayed gaze, in refuge, sought the treacherous paper in his hand. What it beheld there was horrible. Proceed, Miss Spence said. I often think, he faltered, and a, a tree more the thrills my being when I recall your last words to me. That last, that last, that... Go on! That last evening in the moonlight when you... 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 Penrod, Miss Spence said dangerously, you go on and stop that stammering. You, you said you would wait for, for years to, 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 to... Penrod? To win me! The miserable Penrod managed to gasp. I should not have pre permitted permitted you to speak so until we have our, our parents' con consent. But oh, how sweet it! He exhaled a sigh of agony and then concluded briskly, Yours respectfully, Penrod Schofield. But Miss Spence had at last divined something, for she knew the Schofield family. Bring me that letter, she said, and the scarlet boy passed forward between rows of mystified but immoderately uplifted children. Miss Spence herself grew rather pink as she examined the missive, and the intensity with which she afterward extended her examination to cover the complete field of Penrod Schofield caused him to find a remote centre of interest whereon to rest his embarrassed gaze. She let him stand before her throughout a silence equalled, perhaps, by the tenser pauses during trials for murder, and then, containing herself, she sweepingly gestured him to the pillory, a chair upon the platform, facing the school. Here he suffered for the unusual term of an hour, with many jocular and cunning eyes constantly upon him, and, when he was released at noon, horrid shouts and shrieks pursued him every step of his homeward way for his laughter-loving little schoolmates spared him not, neither boy nor girl. "'Yea, Penrod!' they shouted. "'How's your beautiful hair?' And, "'Hi, Penrod! When you're going to get your parents' consent?' And, "'Say, blue stars in heaven, how's your beautiful eyes?' And, "'Say, Penrod, how's your tree moors? Does your tree moors thrill your being, Penrod?' and many other facetious inquiries, hard to bear in public. And when he reached the temporary shelter of his home, he experienced no relief upon finding that Margaret was out for lunch. He was as deeply embittered toward her as toward any other, and, considering her largely responsible for his misfortune, he would have welcomed an opportunity to show her what he thought of her. Chapter 14 Wednesday Madness how long he was kept in after school that afternoon is not a matter of record, but it was long. Before he finally appeared upon the street, he had composed an ample letter on a subject of general interest, namely school life, under the supervision of Miss Spencer. He had also received some scorching admonitions in respect to honourable behaviour regarding other people's letters, and Margaret's had been returned to him with severe instructions to bear it straight to the original owner, accompanied by full confession and apology. As a measure of insurance that these things be done, Miss Spence stated definitely her intention to hold a conversation by telephone with Margaret that evening. Altogether, the day had been unusually awful, even for Wednesday, and Penrod left the schoolhouse with the heart of an anarchist throbbing in his hot bosom. It were more accurate, indeed, to liken him to the anarchist's characteristic weapon, for as Penrod came out to the street, he was, in all inward respects, a bomb, loaded and ticking. He walked moodily with a visible aspect of soreness. A murmurous sound was thick about his head, wherefore it is to be surmised that he communed with his familiar and one vehement, oft-repeated phrase— beat like a toxin of revolt upon the air. Doggone him! He meant everybody, the universe. Particularly included, evidently, was a sparrow, offensively cheerful upon a lamp post. This self-centred little bird allowed a pebble to pass overhead and remained unconcerned, but, a moment later, feeling a jar beneath his feet and hearing the tinkle of falling glass, 
he decided to leave. Similarly, and at the same instant, Penrod made the same decision, and the sparrow in flight took note of a boy likewise in flight. The boy disappeared into the nearest alley and emerged therefrom, breathless, in the peaceful vicinity of his own home. He entered the house, clumped upstairs and down, discovered Margaret reading a book in the library, and flung the accursed letter toward her with loathing. "'You can take the old thing,' he said bitterly. "'I don't want it!' And before she was able to reply, he was out of the room. The next moment he was out of the house. Door gone em, he said. And then, across the street, his soured eye fell upon his true comrade and best friend, leaning against a picket fence and holding desultory converse with Mabel Rorabeck, an attractive member of the Friday afternoon dancing class that hated organization of which Sam and Penrod were both members. Mabel was a shy little girl, but Penrod had a vague understanding that Sam considered her two brown pigtails beautiful. Howbeat, Sam had never told his love. He was, in fact, sensitive about it. This meeting with the lady was by chance, and although it afforded exquisite moments, his heart was beating in an unaccustomed manner, and he was suffering from embarrassment, being at a loss also for subjects of conversation. It is indeed no easy matter to chat easily with a person, however lovely and beloved, who keeps her face turned the other way, maintains one foot in rapid and continuous motion, through an arc seemingly perilous to her equilibrium, and confines her responses, both affirmative and negative, to uh-huh. Altogether, Sam was sufficiently nervous without any help from Penrod, and it was with pure horror that he heard his own name, and Mabel's shrieked upon the ambient air with viperish insinuation. Sam, my, and Mabel, oh, oh! Sam started violently, Mabel ceased to swing her foot, and both, encarnadined, looked up and down and everywhere for the invisible but well-known owner of that voice. It came again, in taunting mockery. Sammy's mad, and I am glad, and I know what will please him. A bottle of wine to make him shine, and Mabel Rawbeck to squeeze him. Fresh old thing, said Miss Rawbeck, becoming articulate. And unreasonably including Sam in her indignation, she tossed her head at him with an unmistakable effect of scorn. She began to walk away. Well, Mabel, Sam said plaintively, following, it ain't my fault. I didn't do anything. It's Penrod. I don't care, she began pettishly, when the viperish voice was again lifted. Oh, 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 who's your beau? Guess I know. Mabel and Sammy. Oh, 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 I caught you. Then Mabel did one of those things that eternally perplex the slower sex. She deliberately made a face, not at the tree behind which Penrod was lurking, but at the innocent and heart-wrung Sam. "'You needn't come limping after me, Sam Williams,' she said, though Sam was approaching upon two perfectly sound legs. And then she ran away at the top of her speed. "'Run, Rigger, run!' Penrod began inexcusably. But Sam cut the persecution short at this point. Stung to fury, he charged upon the sheltering tree in the Schofield's yard. Ordinarily, at such a juncture, Penrod would have fled, keeping his own temper and increasing the heat of his pursuers by back-flung jeers. But this was Wednesday, and he was in no mood to run from Sam. He stepped away from the tree, awaiting the onset. Well, what are you going to do so much? he said. Sam did not pause to proffer the desired information. Chagotny sense was the total extent of his vocal preliminaries before flinging himself headlong upon the taunter, and the two boys went to the ground together. Embracing, they rolled, they pommeled, they hammered, they kicked. Alas, this was a fight. They rose, flailing a while, then renewed their embrace, and grunting, bestowed themselves anew upon our ever too receptive Mother Earth. Once more upon their feet, they beset each other sorely, dealing many great blows oft times upon the air, but with sufficient frequency upon resentful flesh. Tears were jolted to the rims of eyes 
but technically they did not weep. Got any sense? was repeated chokingly, many, many times. Also, dern old fool, and I'll show you. The peacemaker who appeared upon the animated scene was Penrod's great-uncle Slocum. This elderly relative had come to call upon Mrs. Schofield, and he was well upon his way to the front door when the mutterings of war among some shrubberies near the fence caused him to deflect his course in benevolent agitation. "'Boys, boys, shame, boys,' he said. But, as the originality of these expressions did not prove striking enough to attract any great attention from the combatants, he felt obliged to assume a share in the proceedings. It was a share entailing greater activity than he had anticipated, and before he managed to separate the former friends, he intercepted bodily an amount of violence to which he was wholly unaccustomed. Additionally, his attire was disarranged, his hat was no longer upon his head, and his temper was in a bad way. In fact, as his hat flew off, he made use of words that under less extreme circumstances would have caused both boys to feel a much profounder interest than they did in Great Uncle Slocum. I'll get you, Sam babbled. Don't you ever dare to speak to me again, Penrod Schofield, long as you live, or I'll whip you worse, and I have this time. Penrod squawked. For the moment he was incapable of coherent speech, and then, Failing in a convulsive attempt to reach his enemy, his fury culminated upon an innocent object that had never done him the slightest harm. Great Uncle Slocum's hat lay upon the ground close by, and Penrod was in the state of irritation that seeks an outlet too blindly, as people say he had to do something. He kicked Great Uncle Slocum's hat with such sweep and precision that it rose swiftly and breasting the autumn breeze, passed over the fence and out into the street. Great Uncle Slocum uttered a scream of anguish and, immediately ceasing to peacemake, ran forth to a more important rescue. But the conflict was not renewed. Sanity had returned to Sam Williams. He was awed by this colossal deed of Penrod's and filled with horror at the thought that he might be held as accessory to it. Fleetly he fled, pursued as far as the gate by the whole body of Penrod, and thereafter by Penrod's voice alone. You better run. You wait till I catch you. You'll see what you get next time. Don't you ever speak to me again, as long as you— Here he paused abruptly, for Great Uncle Slocum had recovered his hat and was returning toward the gate. After one glance at Great Uncle Slocum, Penrod did not linger to attempt any explanation. There are times when even a boy can see that apologies would seem out of place. Penrod ran round the house to the backyard. Here he was enthusiastically greeted by Duke. You get away from me, Penrod said hoarsely, and with terrible gestures he repulsed the faithful animal who retired philosophically to the stable while his master let himself out of the back gate. Penrod had decided to absent himself from home for the time being. The sky was grey and there were hints of coming dusk in the air. It was an hour suited to his turbulent soul, and he walked with a sombre swagger. Ran like a chardy calf, he sniffed, half aloud, alluding to the haste of Sam Williams in departure. All he is, old chardy calf. Then, as he proceeded up the alley, a hated cry smote his ears. Hi, Penrod! How's your tree moors? And two jovial schoolboy faces appeared above a high board fence. How's your beautiful hair, Penrod? they vociferated. When you're going to get your parents' consent, what makes you think you're only pretty old blue stars? Penrod looked about feverishly for a missile and could find none to his hand. But the surface of the alley sufficed. He made mud balls and fiercely bombarded the vociferous fence. Naturally, hostile mud balls presently issued from behind this barricade, and thus a campaign developed that offered a picture not unlike a cartoonist's sketch of a political campaign, wherein this same material is used for the decoration of opponents. 
But Penrod had been unwise. He was outnumbered, and the hostile forces held the advantageous side of the fence. Mudballs can be hard as well as soggy. Some of those that reached Penrod were of no inconsiderable weight and substance, and they made him grunt despite himself. Finally, one, at close range, struck him in the pit of the stomach, whereupon he clasped himself about the middle silently and executed some steps in seeming imitation of a quaint Indian dance. His plight being observed through a knothole, his enemies climbed upon the fence and regarded him seriously. "'Oh, you're all right, ain't you, old tree moors?' inquired one. "'I'll show you!' bellowed Penrod, recovering his breath, and he hurled a fat ball, thoughtfully retained in hand throughout his agony, to such effect that his interrogator disappeared backward from the fence without having taken any initiative of his own in the matter. His comrade impulsively joined him upon the ground, and the battle continued. Through the gathering dusk it went on. It waged, but the hotter as darkness made aim more difficult, and still Penrod would not be driven from the field. Panting, grunting, hoarse from returning insults, fighting on and on, an indistinguishable figure in the gloom, he held the back alley against all comers. For such a combat darkness has one great advantage, but it has an equally important disadvantage. The combatant cannot see to aim. On the other hand, he cannot see to dodge. And all the while, Penrod was receiving two for one. He became heavy with mud. Plastered, impressionistic and sculpturesque, there was about him a quality of the tragic, of the magnificent. He resembled a sombre masterpiece by Rodin. No one could have been quite sure what he was meant for. Dinner bells tinkled in houses. Then they were rung from kitchen doors. Calling voices came urging from the distance, calling boys' names into the darkness. They called, and a note of irritation seemed to mar their beauty. Then bells were rung again and the voices renewed appeals more urgent, much more irritated. They called and called and called. Thud! went the mud balls. Thud! Thud! Blunk! Oof! said Penrod. Sam Williams, having dined with his family at their usual hour seven, slipped unostentatiously out of the kitchen door as soon as he could, after the conclusion of the meal, and quietly betook himself to the Schofield's corner. Here he stationed himself where he could see all avenues of approach to the house and waited. Twenty minutes went by, and then Sam became suddenly alert and attentive, for the arc light revealed a small, grotesque figure slowly approaching along the sidewalk. It was brown in colour, shaggy and indefinite in form. It limped excessively and paused to rub itself and to meditate. Peculiar as the thing was, Sam had no doubt as to its identity. He advanced. Lo, Penrod, he said cautiously and with a shade of formality. Penrod leaned against the fence and, lifting one leg, tested the knee joint by swinging his foot back and forth, a process evidently provocative of a little pain. Then he rubbed the left side of his encrusted face and, opening his mouth to its whole capacity as an aperture, moved his lower jaw slightly from side to side, thus triumphantly settling a question in his own mind as to whether or no a suspected dislocation had taken place. Having satisfied himself on these points, he examined both shins delicately by the sense of touch and carefully tested the capacities of his neck muscles to move his head in a wonted manner. Then he responded somewhat gruffly, Lo! Where you been? Sam said eagerly, his formality vanishing. Having a mud fight? I guess you did, Sam exclaimed in a low voice. What you going to tell you? Oh, nothing. Your sister telephoned to our house to see if I knew where you were, said Sam. She told me if I saw you before you got home to tell you something but not to say anything about it. She said Miss Spence had telephoned to her, 
but she said for me to tell you it was all right about that letter, and she wasn't going to tell your mother and father on you, so you needn't say anything about it to them. All right, said Penrod indifferently. She says you're going to be in enough trouble without that, Sam went on. You're going to catch fits about your Uncle Slocum's hat, Penrod. Well, I guess I know it. And about not coming home to dinner, too. Your mother telephoned twice to Mama while we were eating to see if you'd come in our house. And when they see you, my, but you're going to get the dickens, Penrod. Penrod seemed unimpressed, though he was well aware that Sam's prophecy was no unreasonable one. Well, I guess I know it, he repeated casually, and he moved slowly toward his own gate. His friend looked after him curiously. Then, as the limping figure fumbled clumsily with bruised fingers at the latch of the gate, there sounded a little solicitude in Sam's voice. Say, Penrod, how... how do you feel? What? Do you feel pretty bad? No, said Penrod, and in spite of what awaited him beyond the lighted portals just ahead, he spoke the truth. His nerves were rested and his soul was at peace. His Wednesday madness was over. No, said Penrod, I feel bully 